me to uh, the book of Acts. We continue our sermon series. Acts chapter 1. We're going to come to the second half of chapter 1 today. This, this uh, episode that uh, is sort of sandwiched right between two very prominent events. Uh, the ascension of Christ and Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. And these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. He has said these things to you that his joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let's pray together. Father, we pray as we just sang in that song that you would indeed abide with us. Fast falls the eventide. Lord, make us ever confident now in the invincible and in the amazing power of the gospel, a power against which nothing can prevail, not sickness or discouragement or our own failures or the failures of others or chaos in the home. Not even the tempter himself. Lord, comfort us now with the promise, with this promise, as we come to your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. That hymn that we just sang, Abide With Me, uh, is a hymn uh, written by uh, Henry Francis Light. Uh, Henry was a priest in an English fishing village. Uh, he served there in this fishing village for many years. Uh, now, for many of those years, <clears throat> Henry suffered with a debilitating lung condition. Uh, his biographer says that, that this condition hung over his life like a blackening cloud. And eventually, uh, this condition developed into full-blown tuberculosis. And in September of 1847, at age 54, Henry ascended the pulpit to preach what would be 
unbeknownst to him, his final sermon. Death was soon at hand. And it was actually that same day after his sermon, after church, uh, that he uh, went for a long walk along the coast in prayer and later emerged from his room with a copy of, of this hymn. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. A hymn which is about the invincible power of grace. How despite the incursion of death and darkness that falls fast like the tide, despite dwindling hopes, despite the schemes of the devil himself, there is nothing that can upset God's plans for his people. In fact, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. I love that line in verse 3. It's where we get the, the title of this sermon. What but thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Friends, I open with this story because it really gets to the heart of, of what our passage is about in Acts chapter 1. Now, as we come upon this account in the second half of Acts 1, we might be scratching our heads a bit. Why do we have a story like this? Why does it even matter? I get, I get why we have the Ascension. I get why we have Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Why do we have sandwiched in between this frankly odd and weirdly gruesome account of Judas' suicide followed by this ordination service? Well, if we stand back and look at the big picture here, here we have a church in crisis. Remember, the twelve apostles were called by Christ to be the very foundation of his church. They were the ones on whom the whole edifice was to be built. And yet there emerged a problem with the disciples. A crack emerged in this foundation. We're told in the Gospels, Satan entered the heart of one disciple, Judas Iscariot, who had Jesus betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And now Judas is dead. He has died in disgrace, leaving the disciples down from 12 to 11. This is a big problem. A problem so big, in fact, that only the king of the church can solve it. This is a structural defect so serious that only God himself can mend it. And that's exactly what he does. Last week we heard about how Jesus is still at work in his church. Well, that's very much what's happening here. Here we see that despite all efforts to destroy the church, even from her inception... Even the fast-falling eventide of the devil himself, Jesus Christ nevertheless builds his church. He beats the odds. He overcomes the, the unovercomable. That's our big idea today. That what the serpent attempts to breach, the serpent crusher repairs and restores. That what the prince of darkness attempts to corrupt and to destroy, the prince of peace heals. We see that here in Acts, and we see that in our own lives today. Three points to our sermon this morning. First of all, the warmth of the church. Second, the office of apostle. And third, the chosen of God. So first of all, the warmth of the church. So remember, this, this comes right off the heels of Jesus' ascension. The most staggering thing that the disciples have ever seen has just transpired before their waking eyes on the Mount of Olives. And what do they do? How do they respond? Well, first, they return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is a Sabbath day's journey, Luke says. In other words, they didn't travel very far. Uh, the Sabbath 
permitted a Jew to travel no more than 2,000 cubits on the Sabbath, so it's about a half a mile, and that's how far they go. And what do they do in Jerusalem? Well, without wasting any time, they return to the upper room, and they gather together as the church. And just as an aside, notice who this church includes. Not just the apostles, but some other noteworthy VIPs, like Jesus' biological family, Jesus' biological brothers. Yes, he had biological brothers. And even Mary herself. Mary, the mother of our Lord, was present here in this first gathering of the church. By the way, this is the last reference that we have to Mary in the New Testament. Now imagine having Mary, the mother of Jesus, in your congregation. (laughs) Or Jesus' brothers. I remember when I was still a young intern, still learning the ropes of of preaching, I was, I was, uh, it was a very nerve-wracking experience, I still have dreams about it, especially because not only was I very, very new at this, but our congregation in California had none other than my favorite theologian as a member. I remember him sitting there and listening very intently, and I was just shaking. Well, imagine having the Theotokos, the mother of God, in your church. The person who raised Jesus, who knew everything about him. But here she is, participating as a member in the first church. You could have looked down the pew and said, oh, hey, there's, there's Mary, the person who raised Jesus. Here she is with 120 other Christians, all gathered together in fellowship, fervent in prayer, united in heart and mind and purpose, following the Scriptures, submissive to the apostles. Now, if you think about it, if there's anyone who could have received special treatment, who you'd think would get the golden buzzer and could skip out on the messiness of church life, It would be Mary. I mean, Mary lived with Jesus, pretty sure she's good to go, but that's not the case. Here, Mary is not as the exalted, sinless queen of heaven, but as an ordinary church member. She, along with the early saints, watched Jesus ascend into heaven, then waste no time in simply being the gathered church. It's interesting how uh, pollsters have observed Christians and how they observe their faith in recent years. Uh, For example, in the last few decades, there has been a growing gap between Christians who practice a, quote, personal faith and Christians who participate in church. For example, Christians for a long time have been very, very good at reading their Bibles. About 35% of Christians read their Bibles weekly, and that, and that percentage has been pretty steady for a long time. But only about 20% of Christians claim to attend church weekly. Church attendance has dropped off sharply in recent years. Now it's true, salvation is an individual thing. R.C. Sproul says that you're never saved by the faith of someone else. And he's right. My, my faith won't get any of you to heaven. And vice versa. However, when we are saved, we are placed into a body, into a community, a congregation of fellow sinner saints. This is where God has designed Christians to live in the world, in the fellowship of the body, gathering, praying, searching the scriptures, everything we see the early church doing here. There's a story that's been passed around. It's the story of a man who comes up to his pastor. This is a man who was a member of of 
his church, but hardly ever attended. And the pastor asks him about it. He says, you know, you used to come to church regularly. You took vows, <coughs> but now you're never around. You don't serve. You don't participate in any ministries. You hardly ever make it to church. And this man replies to his pastor, well, you just don't understand. I don't need the church. I'm perfectly fine listening to Christian music. I watch sermons online. I read my Bible all from the comfort of my couch. Meanwhile, this whole conversation was happening at a picnic, and as the two of them are talking, the pastor walks over to the charcoal grill. He grabs the tongs and he starts adjusting the coals a bit. He moves a, a few coals away from the center, the stack, and he starts moving them out to the edges. And as he does this, the coals that were once white hot gathered with all the other coals start to, start to lose their heat. And after about 10 minutes, the pastor, he points to the coals and he says, you know, 10 minutes ago, these coals were white hot. But now they've been moved away from the heat of the other coals. They're cold. In fact, they've lost their purpose. You see, that's what happens when we abandon the warmth of the church. When we decide to practice our religion in private, when we forsake the body, we lose spiritual heat. Our hearts grow cold toward God and toward our neighbor. It's true, yes, Christianity is personal, deeply personal, but it's never private. We hear a lot today, well, Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. It's just something me between me and the Lord, none of your business. Well, if you look at the Bible, that's a, that's a false binary, because it's very much both. Christianity is something deeply personal between you and the Lord, and it's something public. It's something that you do shoulder to shoulder with others. See, friends, Christianity is not just a set of principles that you believe. It's not a set of feelings inside your heart, nor is it a set of rituals that you do in the comfort of your own house. No, it is a life lived in solidarity with others, wherein we pray for each other, we support each other, we bear one another's burdens, we challenge each other, we keep each other accountable. Even our Sunday gatherings, notice, it's, we're doing it together, right at this moment. Singing, praying, confessing, hearing the word, coming to the table. These are all things that we do as stones gathered together in one spiritual house as sheep gathered together in a sheep pen. This is how the Bible describes the church. In the Bible, Christianity always has a, a tangible texture to it. We gather, we worship, we serve in a real physical place with real physical flesh and blood people, people who know each other, people who brush shoulders with each other, People who are sometimes, yeah, hard to get along with. Brothers and sisters, you and I need the church. We need the gathering of the coals. Because apart from it, we lose heat. We lose purpose. Now, as the church is gathering for prayer here, it turns out that there is a specific Thing that they are praying about, an issue that was actually very urgent. That's the second thing we see in our passage. First, there's the warmth of the church. Second, the office of apostle. <coughs> so in verse 15, Peter stands up and he addresses the church. It turns out there's a matter at hand that requires their immediate attention. They need to select a twelfth apostle. After Judas' betrayal and grisly 
demise, Judas left a vacancy among the twelve, a vacancy that they needed to fill. Now, a couple questions we need to ask here. And if we look closely, we see that both of these questions are answered for us in the Bible. First of all, what's an apostle? And second of all, why does there need to be twelve? So beginning with the first question, what is an apostle? An apostle is different from a disciple. Now, there is some overlap. An apostle is always a disciple, but a disciple is not always an apostle. A disciple is merely a follower of Jesus. We are all disciples of Jesus. An apostle, though, is one who is sent by Christ. That's actually what the word means, one who is sent. An apostle is an ambassador sent by Jesus Christ. Sent to do what? Well, to bear witness of him. To be his ambassador. Apostles are emissaries handpicked by Jesus, representing his power, his word, his authority, especially when it comes to the resurrection. That's what Peter says there in verse 22, that an apostle fundamentally is to bear witness to Easter. Now, lots of Christians, uh, even not too far from this pulpit, uh, would say that the office of apostle is an ongoing office within the church, that, that people today can be apostles. Now, how do we speak to that? Well, in the Bible, even in this passage, we see some basic criteria for apostleship. There's three basic criteria for being an apostle. First of all, in verses 21 and 22, we see that an apostle needs to have been a member of Jesus' entourage, his, his band of disciples from the very beginning, all the way through his resurrection. He needed to have walked with Jesus during those three years. Second of all, as verse 22 says, he needs to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. He needs to have seen Jesus alive and in person. And third, this is the most important, he needs to have been sent by Christ himself. He needs to have been called by Christ personally. This is something Luke talks about back in Luke chapter 6. Uh, even earlier in this chapter, in verse 2, he says that the apostles are those who are the chosen. They are the ones chosen by Christ. Now, upon hearing that, that list, you might notice that we have a little bit of a problem. I mean, here, the apostles need to find another apostle. So they find two men who walked with Jesus, who saw him resurrected. But the problem is, Christ isn't there to personally send him. He's ascended. So what do they do? How can they confirm a new apostle without Jesus being there? Well, notice that even though Christ is not bodily present, he makes his will known to them nevertheless. In fact, Luke goes out of his way here to give us a few clues to indicate that the will of Christ himself is actually guiding their selection. You see this in Peter's reading of Scripture. Notice that Peter quotes the Psalms here. Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. Now, both of these psalms are imprecatory psalms. They are psalms about betrayal. They are psalms about being handed over by an enemy. Now, remember, Peter has just been to seminary. He just spent uh, several weeks with Jesus personally, him and the, and the apostles, learning how to read his Bible in the light of Christ. So this is actually the first time that Peter is emerging and he's exegeting the scriptures as Jesus has taught him to do it in light of himself, with Christ at the center. 
So Peter knows now that these psalms apply directly to Jesus. Jesus is the speaker of these psalms. In other words, Jesus is the one who says of his betrayer, there in verse 20, may his residence become desolate. He says of Judas, let another take his place. So in Peter's mind, Jesus was commanding his apostles in these psalms to replace Judas with another. Christ is with them in the scriptures. He's also with them in prayer. Verse 24, when they pray, You, Lord, are the one who knows the heart of all. Reveal which of these two you have chosen. When they pray this, they are probably praying to the ascended Christ. And there's a lot of reasons to assume that, one of which is the fact that Jesus chose the twelve, as verse 2 says. And here again, lo and behold, they address him who they are praying to as the chooser. So Christ, though absent in the body, was still very much present in this decision. He was the one who commanded them in the scriptures to select a new apostle. And he was the one they prayed to. He is the one who chose this new apostle and was guiding even the casting of the lots to reveal that choice. Now, the big elephant in the room, this is just as an aside, what about Paul? Given these three criteria, how can Paul be an apostle? There's a good answer for that, if that is bugging you. I'm going to punt. Please just come and talk to me afterward. I'd love to talk to you about that. So we talked about what an apostle is. The second question, why did there have to be 12 of them? Why did Peter and the apostles and Jesus, frankly, feel the need to fill this vacancy in the first place? I mean, why couldn't they just build the church with 11? Well, Jesus gives a big clue to why there needed to be 12 in Luke chapter 22. In Luke 22, verse 28, he says, talking to the apostles, You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, Jesus is drawing an intentional correlation between the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. Namely, that he wants his 12 apostles to reconstitute the 12 tribes. In other words, he wants his apostles to be the foundation of his new Israel, the church. Jesus is reconstituting, he's reorganizing his people around these 12 men. And why? Because he's preparing them to send the gospel out to the nations. You remember the disciples' final question before Jesus ascended into heaven. Lord, Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, in a very real sense, Jesus is answering yes with his 12 apostles. He's restoring the kingdom to Israel. Just not the kingdom of old or the Israel of old, but a new kingdom, a new Israel. A kingdom not bound by, by four walls, but one that covers the earth. An Israel not bound by ethnicity but expanded to every tribe and nation and tongue. Jesus essentially told his disciples, you know what, you twelve, my band of twelve, will lead my people into a new age. A new covenant age. An age where there is no Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, but all are one in me. In Christ Jesus. 
You see, this is why it was such a big deal for Judas to betray Jesus. Because Judas was one of the twelve. Luke even says that in, in the scripture passage that was read. Judas, one of the twelve. Therefore, his betrayal caused a crack in the very foundation of what Jesus wanted to build. Jesus' plans to lead his new Israel into a new age seemed to be derailed before it had even left the station. And so before the coming of the Spirit, this problem had to be remedied. This crack had to be fixed. And that's exactly what the apostles aimed to do. The apostles, through the presence of Christ, set their sights on fixing this crack, on adding the man of Christ's choosing to their number. This leads to our final point. The warmth of the church, the office of apostle, and finally, the chosen, the chosen of God. Now, what's really amazing here is that though this might have seemed like uh, a major crisis to the apostles, it was definitely not a major crisis for Jesus. Jesus wasn't at all thrown off by this. Jesus wasn't surprised, you know, by what Satan did here through Judas. Jesus' plans for his church weren't um, hanging on the edge of a knife because of Satan's schemes. No, Christ is in complete control of this situation. And how do we know that here? Well, who are the two stars of this story? Who are the two main characters that we've talked about? It's Judas, and there's Peter. Now, what do these two men have in common? Well, a couple, a couple big things. They were both apostles, and they both betrayed Jesus in his hour of need. One man betrayed Jesus with a kiss. The other denied him three times. In fact, in Luke's account, as we, as we heard uh, read earlier, their stories are actually right next to each other. Two episodes of radical betrayal side by side. And not just that. Here are two men who were under satanic attack. Both men, Satan wanted to claim for himself. Now this is where their two stories start to diverge. Satan entered the heart of Judas and thoroughly claimed him. Remember, Jesus said, what you must do, do quickly. What happens with Peter, though? Remember what Jesus told him. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fall. You see, Peter himself was a living testimony of what our passage is about today. The fact that what the serpent attempts to breach, the serpent crusher repairs and restores. That what the prince of darkness attempts to corrupt and to destroy, the Prince of Peace heals. You see, when it comes to Christ's mission for his church and the wonderful plans he has for you and for me to build a kingdom that cannot be shaken, to make all of his people alive together with him, raising us up with him, seeding us with him in the heavenly places, getting the gospel out, building churches until the day, until the day when he delivers his kingdom to his father after destroying every rule and kingdom and authority. The day when the perishable will inherit the imperishable. The day when we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. And that pronouncement goes forth into all the world, the pronouncement we're all waiting for today. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? That mission, that unfolding purpose cannot be derailed. It goes forth, full speed ahead. The prince of darkness, grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. Amen? I was thinking about it this week. You know, there's so much reckless evil in this world. In fact, it's so constant, it's so violent, it's so ubiquitous that I think for a lot of us it just becomes white noise. For others of us, it, it sickens us. It leaves a blight upon our hearts. It leaves sorrow in the soul. We're just so used to the constant presence of it. We're so used to the sadness, to this, it, to this numbing effect. We see it in the church, too. This evil. William Willimon says that the church meets no failure or deceit in the world that it has not first encountered in itself, even among those who founded and led the first congregation. And he's right. That's what our passage is about today. The very same evil around us, brothers and sisters, that sickens us, lurked its ugly head in the final days of Jesus' life. The serpent crusher came for the serpent, and the serpent bruised his heel. Evil and all of its ugliness, its malice, its cruelty, its ruthlessness, came out guns blazing against the sun and against his disciples, so much so that the foundation of the church itself seemed irrevocably cracked. And yet what did the serpent crusher do? How did he handle this violent rage of the evil one? Well, boys and girls, you know what he did. He died and he rose, and he ascended. In other words, he met Satan's rage with a superior rage, a stronger resolve, a courage, a steadfastness that nothing and no one could possibly overcome, a love that was so intense, so blazing, so perfect, that this love actually came to define love itself for all existence. That's what Jesus met the serpent with until that serpent lay crushed under his heel. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? You see, Martin Luther was right. It wasn't Matthias or Peter or the apostles that thwarted the devil's plans here. Matthias wasn't the ultimate chosen one. It was Jesus. Jesus was the man of God's own choosing, who ensured in blood that his church would flourish, that the gates of hell would never prevail against us. A Christian, Nothing and no one can thwart God's plans for you. Not a lung disease or betrayal by an enemy or doubt or your own failures or the failures of others. Even the grave. These things that, that fill you with fear, these things that cripple you, 
are nothing to the great serpent crusher. They are nothing to the Lord and King of the church. Go in that peace. Live under the banner of his triumph. Be established on the sure foundation of his apostles. Knowing that his plans for you, he will bring to completion. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we rejoice in that wondrous promise that the work that you begin, you will complete and that there's nothing and no one, nothing in heaven above or on the earth beneath, nothing that is behind us, nothing in front of us can separate us from the power and the presence of your love. Lord, we pray that we would be confident in that, that we would be comforted by that, especially in a world that can seem so dark, a a world that, that, that seems to steal our comfort away from us, even before we get out of bed in the morning. Lord, we pray that we would rest secure on this solid gospel foundation. We pray this in Jesus' name.